Acknowledging the complex and heterogeneous nature of Indian music, Dr. Ranade vigorously attacked preconceived hierarchies and barriers within musical categories and genres. Even though he was trained in the Hindustani tradition under stalwarts like Gajanan Boa Joshi, Lakshman Rao Bodas, Prahlad Ganu, and Professor B. R. Devdar, his eclectic approach shone brightly in his scholarly writings on all categories of music, folk, religious, tribal, and even on popular music, fusion, and con confluence music. His deep and awe-inspiring erudition had an effervescent quality fueled by his perpetual, almost childlike curiosity about anything to do with music. Film songs, background music, jingles, signature tunes for broadcasting and telecasting, version music and remixes, political songs, doorbells, melodic motor horns, lobby music, and more. Dr. Ranade's proclivity for codification, categorization, and definition has given us a vocabulary that has become integral to the discourse on Indian music. From among the more than 20 books that he wrote on music, I am singling out one, Music Context, a concise dictionary of Hindustani music, which is emblematic of his rigorous pursuit of the nuances of performing and scholastic traditions. Among other things, it demystifies North Indian music, steering clear of the conventional adjectival approach that most other endeavors adopt. He shook up scholarly circles when he pertinently questioned the all-encompassing term Indian music, being more than acutely aware of the multiplicity of categories, systems, and genres of music in India, he stressed the need to examine non-elite musical categories and regional musicological literature along with Sanskrit Sangeet Shastras to gain a holistic picture of Indian music and musicology. Dr. Ranade's ability to make connections between seemingly unrelated historical events and musical occurrences stemmed from his conviction that the evolution of musical ideas was influenced by a variety of circumstances such as geographical contiguity, religious connections, political subservience, migration, trade, and increasing interest in other performing cultures. Not just that, he realized that such confluences led to the formation of cultural zones which more than political boundaries formed contiguous areas of musical practices. This led him to closely examine the relationship between Arabic and Persian musical systems and their Indian counterparts. In a globalizing world that seeks to stamp out differences between cultures and celebrate a homogenized consumerist worldview, Dr. Ranade's formulation of the concept of cultural zones is of indescribable value. As a teacher, he ensured that his knowledge was freely available to students. As the first director of the University Music Center at Bombay University, he brought together elements of the Guru Shishya tradition and modern institutionalized education. Under him, the center had some of the best known gurus of Hindustani vocal music on its staff and the coursework was developed in consultation with them. This is where, as a teacher, Dr. Ranade made operational the inseparable relationship between the practice and the theory of music, which formed one of the cornerstones of his holistic perspective of not just musical pedagogy, but to the study of music at large. Dr. Ranade's compositions for Khayal, Launi, Bhajan, and other forms, and his theater and film work, all bore his stamp of individuality. He was capable of articulating his compositional approach in careful detail, unfolding every step for the listener, thus demystifying the process while retaining its magic in performance. Incisive and precise, 
analytical and informative, witty and thought-provoking. Dr. Ranade was a master at making the most complex of concepts sound simple and tangible through his lectures. Today, artists, scholars, and audiences will miss him, but his legacy will live through his music, his books, his lectures, and more. The Dr. Ashok Da Ranade Memorial Trust has been formed with a view to offering support to the kind of work that he himself would have done and encouraged, had death not snatched him away in such an abrupt and untimely manner. The series of annual memorial lectures that we have decided to organize is a step in that direction. And above all, this event is also a tribute to an extraordinary scholar and an exceptional human being. To deliver this evening's lecture, we have with us Dr. Professor Ganesh Devi, eminent author, literary critic, scholar of aesthetics, and founder of Bhasha Research Center. I request Anjum Rajabali to formally invite Dr. Professor Devi. Friends, on behalf of the Dr. Ashok Dharanade Memorial Trust, I would like to affirm how privileged indeed we feel to have a person of the stature of Professor Dr. Ganesh Devi as the speaker for the second Dr. Ashok Dharanade Memorial Lecture. Given the large number of multidisciplinary achievements, a proper introduction of Dr. Devi would indeed occupy several pages, but I will try and be as succinct as possible. While most people here are aware of the work that Dr. Devi has been doing, at least in the field of language, what is really striking is the wide-ranging nature of resonances that are apparent between his framework for his academic and activist work and Dr. Ranade's scholastic and pedagogic work. In that sense, in that as is becoming increasingly clear, in today's world, I'm sorry, in that sense, the label of cultural activist applies to both. And as is becoming increasingly clear in today's world, the most potent catalyst for social transformation is indeed cultural activism. In Dr. Devi's own words, and I quote, culture is at the very heart of the process of empowerment and social development. A quick glance at Dr. Devi's academic, vocational, and activist background and work reveal, reveals a whole spectrum of multidimensional interests that define his work and I dare say his personality. He was educated at Shivaji University, Kolhapur, and the University of Leeds, UK. He has been a professor of English at the MS University, Baroda, has held fellowships at Leeds and Yale Universities, and has been a Jawaharlal Nehru Fellow, too. Dr. Devi is also a literary critic, and more importantly, a cultural activist, as I said. He founded the Bhasha Research Center at Tejgarh near Baroda in 1996 for the study, documentation, and conservation of Adivasi languages, arts, and culture. He has been the director of Sahiti Academy's project on literature in tribal languages and oral traditions. More recently, he led a comprehensive survey of Indian languages, the People's Linguistic Survey of India, which is being published in 50 volumes. He has published 14 books in English, one in Marathi and two in Gujarati, and has won prestigious literary awards in all these languages. He was, he was given the Lingua Pax Award of 2011 for his work on language conservation. Along with Lakshman Gaikwad and Mahashweta Devi, he is also one of the founders of the Denotified and Nomadic Tribes Rights Action Group, the DNTRAG. Once again, I would like to welcome Dr. Devi for this lecture, and now I invite him to please come onto the stage. Dr. Devi, please. I would like to request our friend, colleague, comrade, associate, mentor, Shubha Mudgal to please come and welcome Dr. Devi formally with uh, a small bouquet and a token that we have for him. Thank you, Shubhaji. 
Professor Dr. Devi, I would request you to please take the mic. Ladies and gentlemen, we lost Professor Ashok Ranade too, too soon. This is actually the time we should have been listening to him. Be with him, learn from him. The kind of intellectual giant he was with the versatility that he had and a very deep understanding of cultural changes that he showed. His not being with us is, has created a vacuum which is not filled and may not be filled any soon. And it's a time when actually we required him all the more that he's not with us. If I accepted to speak, it is out of my gratitude to him as a student of literature and culture. I did not have an opportunity of meeting him personally, but I knew of his work and I knew of the framework that you refer to. And in fact, for this evening, I had chosen out of that framework a very small component of all the books that he wrote, because my access to him was through books, and I could read Marathi as well as English. One that struck me as a book very close to my own concerns was on ethnomusicology. He would not have liked to use that title. He had contested that almost 15 years before he wrote this book. He did not write the book, it came as a result, it came uh, as a series of lectures, Professor Karnik Memorial Lectures, he gave in two lectures, uh, then uh, subsequently published in 1992. And in this book, he details how ethnomusicology fed into the Indology project of the British of understanding, but understanding within quotations, and in a way devastating India. At the beginning of those two lectures, he raised many questions, very pertinent questions, questions which have been, uh, which have been asked but not fully answered uh, over the last two centuries. He begins asking what happens when two, two cultures come together and particularly when one of those is dominant and the other dominated culture. Is it that the dominated culture automatically accepts everything from the dominating culture? Is it that certain strategies are evolved? Is it that what results out of it is an understanding that is not perfect but necessary? Several questions he raises and then tries to show how the project of ethnomusicology that the British colonials undertook with regards to India was a companion project to the project of Indology, which is trying to understand India in a way that was congenial to their imagination and their sense of memory, and not actually a, graph, a, 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 a graphic, a, 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 a snapshot of what India actually was. The conclusion of that book, those two essays, those two lectures, is a fantastically insightful conclusion, but I will mention it when I conclude what I have to say. <laughs> the question as to what happens when two cultures come together in a situation of combat, or sometimes in a situ situation of complicity, or of collaboration, or of conflict, of course, uh, as, uh, as uh, he reminds us, this is not the first time that happened in India, that this happened in India. And the history of such cultural clashes and collaborations in India is a very long history. And for him, India is a spectrum and not a spot. India has many and not one. And uh, uh, that's, uh, that's, a, that's, uh, that's a remarkably realistic view of the Indian traditions or set of traditions. And for want of a convenient English term, I will use the term tradition, whereas I should have been saying 
several traditions of hundreds of traditions and so on as he would also like to uh, like me to do the question of aesthetics for the contemporary indian arts has to be seen in the context of those traditions or that tradition has to be seen in the context of the historical experience of the combat or the complicity between the clashing cultures but if i may mention that the term aesthetics is no longer fashionable if i were to go back to the university which i left some time back uh, nobody would admit me if i were saying uh, i were to say that i want to discuss aesthetics that's no longer a very fashionable term in the academic discourse uh, this is a term of the 19th century origin it gained currency it gained popularity enormous popularity in the 19th century and a, a, a certain fallout of that popularity reflected in the indian situation the first half of the 20th century till uh, uh, till uh, 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 murdekar's times probably or maybe professor patan rb patankar's times but i'll use this term aesthetics nonetheless for want of another term which will serve my purpose now aesthetics like history is a problem term i mean history is both a course of events but also a narrative about those that course of events so you have the history history science that's what departments of history do and then there is history that people like uh, maybe akbar or rana pratap or shivaji or whoever made or gandhi or nelson mandela made a aesthetic also pertains to what is there in those things which we generally think are beautiful but it also specifies our response to those things fortunately there is a little bit of convenience that is we can use the term aesthetic when it pertains to the performance production expression and aesthetics as in linguistic and linguistics aesthetics for our response to those things now aesthetics obviously is based in language let me explain what i'm saying the history of human language is just about 70000 years prior to that we did not use full sentences therefore history of creativity in language is a little shorter than that period of 70000 years uh in the course of those thousands of years humans were not necessarily aware that they were creating something extraordinary by way of poetry or theater or dance or music that awareness enters the human consciousness only through a very fundamental phenomenal economic change and that is the rise of the agrarian societies all over the world about 10000 years before our time or 8000 years before our time it is when the production value of production enters the human thought and human language then the production value of art also enters the human thought till then like the dance of honey bees the arts of humans was no not art at all it was life like marx would say i cannot separate work and you know i sorry marx would say that industrial laborers separate work and life so uh, humans did not separate art and life life was art art was life everything was uh, this problem has remained with us till our times just about 200 years back edmund burke had to break his head uh, you know thinking of how to sort this out and he said well those things in arts are beautiful but those things which we think otherwise are beautiful but cannot call arts are sublime <laughs> so so art became restricted as a form of expression as a manner of expression as a style of expression with the rise of language 
with the rise of a certain economic order in the society and the reflection about the arts as a manner of expression, style of expression came much later. The earliest records of this reflection on the manner of expression or style of expression or the content of expression or why expression at all, reflection on the arts, whether it's music, dance, theater, poetry, whatever, that dates back to, it's fairly recent, it's just about uh, two and a half thousand years old. Yes. Uh, in Greece, we find this appearing, emerging, uh, about 2,000 years ago. On our side, if we were to take Tolka PM or the contempt of in Tamil or Bharat Muni, uh, the contemporary of Tolka PM in Sanskrit, uh, in uh, as the, as the beginner of this uh, this uh, task, this mission, this uh, great enterprise of thinking about that, about 2,000 years. That aesthetics developed by Aristotle or Socrates or Plato, even if Plato did not like the arts very much, or developed by Bharat Muni or Tolka Piyar, whoever is the author of Tolka Piyam in Tamil, was aesthetics, thinking about the arts, and their business was to look at what binds various forms of arts, whether it is music, dance, literature, theater, poetry, or whatever they call arts, what is the, what is the basic semiology, what is the moving principle that makes us express? The Greeks use the term weights, the inspired poets. We use the term ojas, that to, you know, uh, get in touch by like uh, like a mad person by some divine uh, energy but the difference was the greeks thought of the thing produced the thing that came out as art which represented a certain reality which precedes that a kind of perfect world a kind of a world of ideas or ideals as the greeks uh, thought the, the Greeks had a very strange uh, view of this world. It was like this theater. Uh, this, uh, the stars, I have said this in Bombay earlier, so I will not uh, go at it you know, at great length, but the, uh, the stars were like the, you know, uh, like holes in the, uh, holes in the sky. And above the sky that we see, there is permanent light. And in that world of permanent light, there is no shadow, and shadow is death. And since there is no shadow there, nothing there dies. And therefore, they don't have to create many tables, but one table is enough. They don't have to create many songs, but one song is enough. So they became ideals, or uh, that, that was a Greek sense of ideal. Uh, so the Greek aesthetics was trying to figure out how the representation of the art was seen as a representation of the ideal and how that is imperfect, how it deviates from the ideal. Sometimes they, they argued that actually art endows something very special to those things created and therefore makes them a little better than the ideal things. But generally the view held then was that the representation is inadequate. And therefore, one needs to represent again and again till one creates a perfect representation closest to the ideal. That was the basis of the Greek aesthetics. On our side, the basis was we didn't get, we didn't get into the question of the thing in itself, the creation. We thought that the creation was a divine expression. It was expression of divinity because Kavi is a mere vehicle of a divine idea or thought or experience or a nameless thing and therefore any poem, any po anything that any dance, theater, anything created, don't discuss the question if it is perfect or imperfect. What can be perfect or imperfect is our consciousness. The perceiving consciousness could be imperfect, inadequate consciousness. And we got a huge amount of philosophy on this inadequacy of the human consciousness, the, uh, 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 which uh, results into avidya sometimes. 
uh, which uh, which uh, results into vimurta sometimes which results into loss of memory at times i mean all all kinds of religious texts philosophical texts aesthetic texts are talking about how the how the you how we the perceivers have to cultivate our consciousness how the rasika has to become sarude not just sarude is not just empathetic you know that's a poor translation it is actually this needs to be translated in the light of another expression which came up in relation to uh, the natya shastra and that is uh, kavita is kavya is 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 uh, is, uh, is the sahodara of brahmanand is born of the same joy that you have in in discovery of the divine so in that in the way the term sahodar is used saruda is used and therefore one has to one has to be like the poet one has to be the poet one has to wipe out the duality between the poet and you know and that's how we respond to our music in this country till today you know when i go on nodding really it's not because i got a problem there or because i have no words at all but it is wiping out you know facing my personality and try to get into the under the skin of the singer be one with the music where where music wipes out the distance between the singer and the and the listener and so on that was the basis of our aesthetics but please uh, let's not forget that the idea of literature idea of music idea of dance painting they change what one generation thinks what, what one generation describes as poetry five generations later no longer remains poetry it can become something else it might become mahakavya it ca- it might become itihasa it might become smruti it might become shruti it might become bhakti it might become folk songs but every few generations the idea of what is music what is dance what is drama what is theater what is painting they keep changing there is no permanent idea one settle and settle for ever which will be there to the end of this world about the one single idea of what art is or what the arts are these ideas must change and they change primarily because of economic reasons which lead to cultural changes and so on very briefly if i have to run through the changes on the western side once this idea of aristotle i'm referring to aristotle's poetics the idea of representation imperfect inadequate representation or representation which somehow tries to make things a little better and brings them closer to the ideal things that changes as soon as the idea of the cosmos undergoes a change when the idea that the universe is like a box was dropped and the idea ac- ac- accepted idea then was that well somehow it, it seems to be cyclical circular somehow it seems to be moving somehow the planets are in a motion immediately they drop aristotle and the ptolemy's world takes over and instead of talking about arts making things better arts are put to the service of making human beings a little better they become didactic rather than mimetic rather than miming rather than copying the ideal they become didactic arts they instruct the readers they instruct the listeners they instruct the audiences and so on this is an epistemic change the entire episteme has changed and with that the economics of the time change the philosophy of the time change the law of the educational the methods of education change everything all disciplines change uh, it is like the building block of knowledge goes through a dramatic not dramatic a radical change and so you have different kinds of knowledge buildings again aesthetic is one of those so aesthetic changes 
and when Ptolemy becomes outdated and you have again a Copernicus, a Newton, a Galileo kind of, sort of uh, idea of the world, you have some hesitation in going entirely by Ptolemy's idea and you move a little further then you get into a romantic and expressive idea of the arts. That idea, th that arts must express because there is, you know, there is a universe within you and unless that is expressed, what you express does not become the arts. So you have the mimetic arts, didactic arts, some, uh, some 1100, 1200 years later and another 800 years later, once again an epistemic change, you move into what is romantic, what is expressive. It must be express literally, I mean something that is in your heart has to be pressed out like uh, that fellow who's often abused uh, by teaching him too much in our classes Wordsworth said no poetry is a spontaneous overflow of like you know something so it must overflow like the water tank overflowing uh, on our side too the ideas of literature, poetry, drama, dance music kept changing. Of course, we have the Bharat Muni's Natya Shastra, we have the Natya Shastra Bharat Muni as the polar star, as the Lord star. And one must always uh, start learning the mudras and the chinnas and the bhavas from there with reference to that text. But that's the nature of a practice. That's the nature of a tradition. But if you think of, say, <coughs> what, what uh, uh, Bharata was saying, what Bharat Muni was saying is that the inadequate consciousness of humans cannot understand the work that divinity inspires among poets and performers and singers. If you want to understand, please try to break it down into smaller components. And so, instead of the experience of entire play, please try to understand the different rasas. This is Hasya Rasa, this is Shunga Rasa, this is Shoka, this is that breaking down in as a help to our consciousness, not as an autopsy, not as a uh, postmortem of the work of art, but it is to help our consciousness, the breaking down, making you know smaller units which we can then uh, really slowly and talk about uh, the, uh, the you know uh, the uh, Shungara in one play, Hasya in another play and so on, and recount it so many times and go over it again and again till our consciousness becomes adequate to be one with the poet's consciousness, the singer's consciousness, and we manage to wipe out the distinction between the two. That change. We have Anand Vardhan, for instance. We have Dandin, of course, who presages, who, who begins talking about the Ritis. He says, don't break down poetry into rasas. Break them down, break poetry down into styles regional styles at that. So what was a psychological metaphor for Bharata? The mind of the, you know, the mind of the uh, audience. Dandi actually translates that into literal geographical, re different rethis. And he had many followers, numerous followers, beginning with Dandi going to Matanga of Brahadeshi in the uh, probably 14th century a distance of almost eight, nine centuries. This uh, geographical breakdown of styles uh, kept happening in our country. Then comes Anand Vardhan. He was a very talented, very gifted aesthetician. And he said, by then, the, 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 the Manu Sahita had set in in a very entrenched uh, manner. And, so, and social fragmentation had taken place irreversibly in terms of caste and particularly in terms of non-pardonable extra-community marriage. Punishments were based on, you know, endoga, endo, uh, endogamy was made the law of the society. Anand Vardhan does not talk about endogamy or Manu Sahita, but he does talk about the levels of meaning in terms of a hierarchy, that you have a, a superficial meaning, then there's a hidden meaning, there's yet another, and further up, 
the highest kind of meaning. So that hierarchy is there. We have Kuntak, who is once again trying to look at the text. It is, it is with Abhinav Gupta that Indian aesthetics goes through an epistemic change. Till Abhinav Gupta's times, all, the, all those who followed Bharata have taken Bharata's meaning but used it differently in the context of their social orders. It is Abhinav Gupta who tries to synthesize things, a grand synthesis he attempts, bringing in Buddha and Krishna, bringing in Nyaya and the contemporary philosophies of Tantra. In fact, Abhinav Gupta, a Kashmir uh, scholar, was a great scholar of Tantra. Abhinav Gupta tried to synthesize things so much that he decided not to see any distinction at all, which Bharata had so meticulously established 900 or 1000 years before his times, between drama and poetry. For Abhinav Gupta, drama and poetry were not just at par, they were the same. And with Rasas, Abhinav Gupta refused to accept that flaws can occlude, temporarily stop the flow of the divine. And if all of us are made of the divine stuff, if, if all of us are Brahman, if all of us are Tat, indescribable that, then there is no question of our not understanding the uh, and, uh, and Abhinav Gupta was uh, not just a poet, he was also a great singer, it seems. That's what you know, people of his times say about him. The poets that followed in India, the Bhaktas, the Bhakti school, you know, not one school but several schools, beginning with the Shaiva cults in the south, spreading to the north, beginning with the 11th century, going through Maharashtra of uh, Jnaneshwar and so on, and then subsequently Eknath and further Tukaram, and in the, in the in, uh, Kashmir Shaivism uh, f uh, blossoming into other, f uh, other forms of uh, joy and ecstasy, and Sufism coming in at various stages, beginning with the 11th century to the 17th century. I have to take these large chunks of time. It is not my fault, it is their fault. <laughs> <laughs> so, in, uh, in uh, Bharata's Natya Shastra, unity was the principle. It was based on the idea of unity between humans and the divine, and achieving that perfect unity was the aim of the arts. In Abhinav Gupta's aesthetics, continuity was the basic principle in many ways. In the bhakti poetry, bhakti performance, bhakti theatre, bhakti music, subjectivity was the principle. And in that neither God nor man was perfect. And both could get into a dialectic the dialectic, if God could become subjective, not just remain objective, invisible, tat, brahman, permanent, forever, indescribable, but take a human form, maybe buffalo, maybe a pillar, like in Pandarpur, or maybe a, a lover, or whatever. And the bhaktas then would, uh, would, uh, uh, would uh, crave for that appearance. For the bhaktas, again, there was no distinction between art and life. The epistemy had changed. For Tukaram, his bhakti was not a profession or mission or an NGO. Or it was all time, every, or politics, I mean, it was, it was all time. It, in his business, I mean, he ran some business for a while, unsuccessfully. He had bhakti. And in his singing like mad, even when his uh, scripts of his poems, manuscripts of his poems were drowned in the, uh, the river Indrayani, 
bhakti spread from end to another end and it continued and in that continuity which abhinagupta had made possible the subjectivity subjectivity was for, foregrounded by this now these are three epistemic changes and the idea of arts change in the west they change as i described in our tradition also they change no idea of art is permanent art has permanence because it has transcendence but no idea of art has permanence when the british arrived here we encountered the western tradition coming to us through the british and coming to us through the british uh, among some of the very best of the british minds creative minds when we encountered the romantic generation uh, the, uh, when english was introduced in india as a language of education uh, in the air in france in germany and in england uh, the romantic generation was there and they were a little kinder to us uh, had had we got the english language 100 years before probably uh, all our creativity would have been finished but this this left us some space because they came very close closest to the indian way of perceiving things but this was the colonial encounter and in a colonial encounter one of the two major things that happen let me first mention the two major things and then i'll speak about one of those two the two major things are the imagination of the colonize gets truncated for me imagination is not my ability to see dreams and you know that is hallucination <laughs> imagination is not my you know imagining thing because that is lie imagination is in hobbes's terms how images of objects enter the eye through the eye and come to rest in the brain and get uh, kind of uh, processed now what happens with help of the objects to the eye is actually pure physics optics it allows us to grasp space if there were no objects and no light there would be no space at all so we you know we grasp space so imagination gets truncated because the dominator culture has no mastery over its own space and that mastery is made virtual it is made ritual mastery like we we had so many rajas and rao sahibs and rai sahibs but nobody really had a you know no it was nobody's call to decide about the land here land ownership land titles and so on so imagination gets truncated the other thing of those two things is memory is affected now memory is our device uh, le let me first say that there is no time in this world there is no thing called time uh, i have sparrows at home in my garden they have no time my dog at home i have one and i love it has no time we have created time because the way the human mind is engaged with language which at one stage about 30000 years before our time before our day imagine the past tense and we started referring to things absent yesterday i had a blue shirt on is you know things which don't exist we devise we devise a way of telling lies in a way uh, talking about non non present non non uh, non real things because of the past tense uh, we became capable of envisioning time thinking of time and once having created time we had to create memory not just individual memory but even memory has a public existence uh, all the work that universities in the world are doing is carrying that public memory forward uh, giving that public memory validity whether it actually deserves or not individual memories are not 
you know, I'm talking of that, you know, communal memory, community memory, memory uh, that is, uh, that, is uh, that uh, goes beyond uh, one's cane, one's uh, uh, reign, one's limits, and so on. We imagine, first we imagine time, and then in order to control time, regulate time, we develop memory as a way of connecting us with others, us with God, us with land, the earth. That memory, in, I was talking about those two things that colonialism, domination affects. One is the imagination gets truncated, and then one can get into fabulous space, or some kind of uh, euphoria of the space to come in future, as in Bunking, uh, Anand Mat we see, the space to come in future. Uh, or, and the second thing that happens is uh, memory gets twisted and a thing called amnesia is introduced, cultural amnesia is introduced. Now please remember, uh, I'm sorry, I'm using a very bad sentence. I want to talk about loss of remembering, and so I cannot say, please remember, you know. So, <laughs> amnesia is not wiping out of memory. Amnesia, as Freud describes, is a selective way of remembering only certain things and not remembering certain other things. The British told us, you know, go to uh, visit the Asiatic Society uh, debates in Calcutta of 1780s. And Sir William Jones, in his very first lecture, says, I shall talk about India up to the 11th century. That is, from beginning, from the very beginning, from the Vedas and so on. He thought that was the beginning, to the 11th century. But not beyond that. Because beyond that, it's all decline, degradation. If they had not held that, if they had not held that view, that 11th century onward to the 17th century, India has declined. There was no justification for their coming here and ruling us. So they had to have that view. Actually, from the 11th century to the 18th century is the time, an absolutely fascinating time in the cultural history of any country in the world. This is when we created new languages, Bangla, Assamese, Marathi, Kannad. Kannad is now considered a classical language. Marathi is also on way of, you know, way to be, uh, being considered classical. But 11th century onwards, new Indian languages sprung up, new creativity, new arts, new epistemy of the aesthetics. But William Jones said decline. We accepted that version. We accepted the version that medieval India was all bad, and some of them, rabid uh, sectarian, uh, felt that it became bad because some polluting forces came in and so on. Uh, that was even worse. And uh, some of it was tacitly encouraged by the terminal kind of terminology that was used by uh, uh, Hallhead, Jones, and uh, other people, and the, uh, the 19th century British uh, administrators. Amnesia made us cultivate a very poor self-view. We felt all good that happened was in the Sanskrit tradition, which in any case Indians had given up long time back. They had not forgotten. They revered, they respected it. But, uh, but 18th century Bombay Wallas did not converse in Sanskrit. They conversed in Warli language, or Marathi language, or the Ghati language, or whatever, you know, Kokni language, or Parsi language, or Gujarati language. Sanskrit had gone. But we thought, oh, India was glorious, wasn't it? All wonderful things. It was golden age. Sonia Zadhur Nigatota. But last thousand years are bad. Cultural amnesia. And because of cultural amnesia, we also accepted the view that whatever comes from the West is necessarily good. At one time, William Jones attempted to write score for Indian music. He tried to make oral Indian music, written music. Thank goodness his efforts did not go beyond a point. 
and you know we could wait till uh, uh, bhatkande ji uh, came along and did something uh, very very good to music but with literature we accepted that the western novel is better than the uh, katha sarit sagar I mean, I don't mind appreciating Dickens. I don't mind appreciating Hardy, or Wordsworth, or Tennyson, or Arnold. I have no quarrel with. I, I I just love those books. My unease is with the fact that in India we developed a lopsided view of ourselves, our arts, and the worst among the opinions that we brought in was. that unfortunately indians have not developed aesthetics in literature they all said for almost 100 years a 100 years that india india does not have literary criticism everything else is okay but there is no literary criticism and so there must be something you know some something inadequate with the indian mind indian personality and so on we forgot the fact that for a thousand years our poets decided that literary criticism is trash it is not necessary it's you know sub foregrounding subjectivity is necessary not foregrounding the text textuality